is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Sex Education, Season 3, Episode 8. In this, the last episode of the season, where there are so many, like, there are so many loose threads. There is so much left. And I just loved this season so much. I'm devastated to have to say goodbye again. Can't we just, can't we just have one more episode as a treat? Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Ashley for commissioning this episode. So, full disclosure, I watched this episode like immediately after finishing recording last week. So I've seen it twice now. I cannot tell you guys. I watched it right away because I just needed to know what was going on with Jean and if she was okay. And I finished it. It was so good. And then today I was like, Ooh, sex education. I get to watch another episode. And then I realized I had watched it already. And my little heart broke a little bit. (laughs) I shouldn't have done that to myself, but Oh my God. Um, this is just so packed. Okay. There is something that I need to start off with because I feel like I didn't really give it enough attention last episode, but the fact that Maureen and Michael slept together again, um, and Michael slept over and I was saying that like, I was extremely worried about how Adam was going to react to the fact that his dad was home and whether or not he was going to stay, the fact that his mother slept with him is a weird thing to deal with. And this is not unusual. I know that a lot of people, they say they're going to get a divorce and then they have like a difficult time letting go of each other. Breakups are hard. Feelings are complicated. So I was really, really unsure of how they were going to handle this because it could be a step toward Adam making up with his dad, like the two of them connecting a little bit. But but considering the breakup he just had, I felt like, you know, or he hadn't had a breakup, but he had had a heartbreak. This episode is when there's an official breakup. And instead, what we get this episode is Maureen waking up, realizing that she slept with him and being like, oh my God, and having a bit of a moment, not just like necessarily pure regret, but a kind of like, oh, I really lost my head for a second there. And I don't know if that was a good call. And she basically kicks him out before Adam will notice he's been there, which I personally think was a good call. And later on, um, she finds out inadvertently from Amy, who doesn't realize that Adam's mom isn't aware that he's gay. I think his mother like suspected, but Amy straight up says that Adam and Eric are together. And you can see this moment of like deep appreciation suddenly for like knowing something more about her son and realizing what's really going on. And if she sees the slip about the dog show and there's a really cute, like there's a moment where she says um, to Adam, like first what's this? And he tells her, and said, I didn't think you'd want to come. And she's like, of course I would want to come. And then she says, you should invite people to things. It makes them feel like you care. Which was an interesting way to put it because I don't think of inviting somebody as making it seem like you, the person doing the thing, cares about the person you're inviting. I've never really like put it in those terms. It's always been for me, you show up to show them that you care. And um, I wonder about the number of things that I never told people about that I was doing, because there's a lot that I just don't 
like to involve others in. I have a kind of like wall up in a lot of ways in my life. And it's not that I won't tell people about it afterward, but I don't like to, you know what I mean? So it just sort of brought me up short and made me kind of wonder like, "Mm, maybe I should be a little bit better about that. I don't know. But he also invites his teacher and both of them go. And afterward, Adam wins a honorable mention. Can I just tell you guys how much I appreciate this? I was so sure that we were going to have Adam win a prize. He does not win a prize. And I cannot emphasize enough how much we need more stories like this one and not stories of a kid who's magically amazing at a thing first try. I understand the temptation and there may even be reasoning within the story as to why somebody's amazing at a thing first try. And if so, that's an exception. That's fine. But for me, the expectation of being great at something on the first try it became like a very real expectation. It was not meant, it was not something that I imagined as the exception. That was how I expected it to go because I was good at many things and I was very special according to everybody who told, talked to me about myself. And so I was just going to be good at the thing. And when I wasn't, it was a genuine shock and like embarrassing. And I don't think I'm alone in that. There was a real rash of gifted programs that sort of infected a lot of us, I think, with this weird, like, value system and warped standard that has remained with us as adults and made us feel like if we're not immediately low-key exceptional at a thing, there's no point doing it. And... There are so many stories in which that is how it goes. Somebody does something exactly one time and they suddenly sail to the front of the class or they're the best in their clan or their group or whatever. And it doesn't seem like it took a lot of effort to get there because they just happen to be born with this innate talent. And I'm so glad they don't do that. And they have Adam get an honorable mention because... For the first time, he did exceptionally well, but he isn't up in the class of people who have been doing this for a minute, and he shouldn't be. And this is something that I really, really appreciate, because there is something to be said for how much those stories simultaneously can set up a false expectation for a lot of young people, and those stories can simultaneously devalue the work other people have been putting in to grow and be better, that you can work as hard as you want. And if somebody shows up who just happens to be super talented, they will absolutely blow you out of the water, no matter how committed you are. That is the kind of thing that drives me nuts. And it is pervasive. It is so, so common that it's like more often the norm than not. So I just had to call that out as something that I really appreciated because He accomplished something. The fact that they mentioned him at all, which you don't get the sense is something that they've like, that's not standardized that they do an honorable mention. That's meaningful. But because he's got his father in his head, he isn't as excited about this as he should be because he has this like, again, a warped standard of if you're not going to be the best at it, then don't do it. So he says to his mother, don't tell dad I didn't win a proper prize. And she says, okay, but why? And Adam says he would just be disappointed. And in response to this, Maureen has a moment. And then she texts her ex-husband, her husband, I guess still, because they had agreed that he would make dinner for her that night and she'd come over. And she cancels because, as she puts it, it was a mistake and this is too confusing for Adam. I am so proud of her. Like, honestly, she is genuinely putting her kids' well being ahead of her husband's feelings. And it is wild how often that's not what people do. 
And it is wild how often fathers expect to be coddled at the expense of their kids, even though they claim to care about their children. It's like until their ego is on the line. And then all of a sudden they're kind of not as secure as it seemed. And I love that she draws this line and I think it's more than fair. Yes, they slept together and maybe they had a great time. I don't even know how it went, you know, but I will say though, she drops his salad on the ground, which I thought was extremely insulting. I'll just, I didn't mention that, but she dropped the bowl face down on the ground, full of salad. Rude. Anyway. Up to this point, we have not seen Michael make the slightest effort at reconnecting with Adam. And Adam needs somebody. I mean, we get to see a bit of a support system here with his mom and his teacher, and it was so nice to see. And even Raheem, um, which is really, really fun. But I don't like Michael has his own thing that he is working through personally, you know, learning about his feelings about things and bullying and the, you know, sort of perspective he's getting on his own childhood and the way he sees the world. And that's all well and good. And he should be working on that. That's incredibly important. That's like the main thing. But he has had all season to reach out to his son and hasn't done it. And so, in my opinion, ignoring Adam and trying to weasel his way back in just via Maureen is sorely missing the point. And I just want next season for him to realize that he's trying to get a relationship back together with her and acting like it's not about the whole family how this was going to impact Adam didn't even enter his mind. She's the one who had to draw this line. So as much as I have grown to have a lot more sympathy for Michael and want to see him succeed, there there is a lot less growth for him than it can than I like kind of want to give him credit for, if that makes sense. I am tempted to be like, "Oh, he's grown so much. He's grown a little." But the kid that he fucking kind of tormented and traumatized and scarred hasn't been, like, even spoken to. And it's to the point where Adam is doing something that he genuinely loves, gets an honorable mention on his first try, but he doesn't want his father to hear about it because he's afraid of him. That's fucked up, Michael, and you're going to need to fucking go deal with that. So as sad as it was in that moment when he has to blow the candle out and the music stops after being excited that Maureen's coming over, I can't feel bad for him because he's trying to make it all about him and her. And that's not all it is. It's not. And he's just trying to sort of pretend this whole thing with Adam isn't happening or isn't as important that if he repairs things with Maureen, then Adam will what just have to kind of go along because he doesn't get a say since he's just a teen in the house. No, sir. Mm -mm. That's exactly the kind of attitude that got you here. So I just wanted to talk about Maureen out of the gate because I just, what's going on with her is really interesting. And, um, I'm going to bounce sort of back to Jean because Maureen in this is starting the, the episode starts with her showing up at Jean's house to, um, or no, first she wakes up with him and kicks him out, but then she goes to Jean's house to pick up a bunch of stuff and, uh, runs across Amy. And there is like some hijinks with her locking the keys in and Amy having to take a nervous poo. I fucking love her so much. And she talks to Amy about the anxiety of having to dump her boyfriend, which Amy does by the end of this episode. And I love this. Both of them are sort of struggling to figure out who they are if they're not in a relationship because Amy is somebody that's always had a boyfriend. And I can relate to that very strongly. Um, I've just been in one relationship after another with barely any breaks. I'll like, And it's not a conscious thing. I'm not somebody who's afraid of being alone. 
I just really love dick. I do. And it tends to like morph into a relationship, even if that's not initially what I was after. So forgive me, but I really like the connection between Amy and Maureen as they both sort of realize that like being alone and learning how to be alone are, those are like skills. Those are a stage of your life. That's really valuable. And I just, you know, part of me wishes that I had taken more time to be single. I had a good stretch there where I was, but it was like, I wasn't quite free yet. I was still like living with my uncle. I was living with family. And uh, then there was a stretch after breaking up with Ruben, but I had already sort of started seeing Brendan. It was just a weird thing. So I just sort of think about Amy and realize like, I relate to her a lot, actually. Um so I like that connection between the two of them. And then eventually they have to like break back into the house and uh, save the, the magazines that they can from Amy's goat who has been eating them, which is definitely a thing a goat will do. And it's just a, a fun little like, you know, bit of hilarity. So that will bring me to Jean. Jean is okay. I really wasn't sure. I didn't think they would kill her off, but I didn't think they wouldn't either. It, you know what I mean? Like, for all I know, it would just be that she was going to leave the show, you know, that the actress was, was planning on some other project and they needed to write her off of the show, which is certainly a thing that can happen. And I'm so relieved that she seems like she is going to be fine. I just appreciate a lot that the show addressed the issues of danger with her giving birth. And there is some fucking top notch acting from Otis. This kid is so good. He may irritate me sometimes, Otis, you know, as a character, but it is never because he doesn't feel like he is who he says he is. It is always because he's like so very much Otis. And I can't get over, like, where did they find this kid? Honestly. And there is a scene in this where he goes in and sees her finally. And she is telling him that she's the king of everything because she's high. And he is doing this amazing, like, laugh cry. And it is so moving and so real. And I just couldn't... The the amount of emotion throughout the episode that he has to call on every second. I mean, after this, it's a goodbye to Maeve. And he doesn't get a fucking break, frankly, you know, the whole time. And he is just on it, on it, on it. Because, oh my God, I am it just, I'm so relieved that she's okay, of course. But also we get like a sort of moment with um, Ola as well, because I was sort of wondering how she was going to take all of this. And she has a scene with her dad outside where she tells him that she thinks she caused this because of some bad thoughts that she was having about Jean, which I thought was really interesting. This is the sort of thing that... um. I can tend to be a little bit too literal and logical sometimes at the expense of emotional reaction or thinking about the irrational reactions that others may have so that I can have some compassion for that. And this moment of her being like, I think I did this because I was thinking terrible things and I was really mad at her. It was one of those moments where at first I was like, what? And then I sort of had to step back and realize like, oh, no, I actually have spoken to people who sort of felt this way. Like they they believed so much in their power to affect things simply because of how they felt that they took responsibility for things that it just didn't make any sense to me to take responsibility for. And I think that honestly, sometimes I can even take it too far where I am so able to separate myself from the responsibility of a thing that maybe I shouldn't because I need to be a little bit more aware. But 
it's just a, it, you know, people have very different ways of handling things. So I won't guilt myself over something that somebody else may, but then I will guilt myself over another thing that I think I should have been able to do better that another person would have just been like, of course you couldn't do that. You had a completely unrealistic expectation for yourself. So, you know, who it's half a dozen of one. Um, but this scene with between her and her dad, it's so great because she tells him, she says, I'm afraid you're going to like your new family more than me. And I was kind of like, really? And then she says, because I only remind you of the pain. And I was like, oh, that didn't even occur to me. But I totally see why that would be something she would be worried about. Like, genuinely, the shock of her saying those words and me just realizing like, of course, it felt so real. And he just tells her, you, on you only remind me of the joy. And it is just the most like, oh, you guys, I loved it so much. Jakob is the best, which makes the fact that at the end of the episode, Jean, I think, is finding out that maybe Jakob isn't the father really 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 upsetting for me it may not be that might not be what she's finding out but it really seems like that's what she has like seen on that paper and i i hate it i hate it i appreciate throwing a curveball in there you know, don't get me wrong. I was so sure he was the dad. It wasn't even like on my mind anymore. But also, oh boy, I feel like he has just started to get past the connection between her and his ex-wife, late wife, I guess you'd say, that this being thrown into the mix, if it is what it looks like, is going to really cause some problems. And I don't know what to think. And I am just... Mm. So, um, let's see. Ashley says, let's not even talk about people going down that avenue. Because I just read today that one of the actresses on the show won't be coming back for season four. And I'm really sad about it still. <gasps> Ashley! I, sh I sh you Should I ask you? Is that a, I mean, it's a spoiler, but also, like, I'll probably see it around. I don't know whether I should ask you or not. It's up to you whether you want to tell me. Um, Ashley says, Ace has been acting in a lot of different things. He's the tiny German child in Boy in the Striped Pajamas that befriends the little Jewish boy. Oh, I never saw that. But okay, that's that face is, like, connecting for me. Um, Ashley says, it makes sense to me because we've never even met her sister. Oops, sorry, things are moving. Uh, we've never even met her sister. And given that there seems to be a big age difference, I wonder if the sister is more aware of the discord in their parents' marriage and blames Jakob. That's true. I keep forgetting that she even has a sister. Um, Ashley says, I think given that they don't outright state it, it could be open-ended at the moment to gauge fan reaction. But yeah, in their counseling session, they mentioned that Jakob has a vasectomy, so I don't think she's his. Um, I do want to know what actress isn't coming back. Um, yeah, I had forgotten about the vasectomy thing. So I just, I don't see how the reaction that she has at reading that, that, uh, test result could possibly be turned into that Jakob is actually the father next season and have that be believable. I don't think, and I might be wrong, but I don't think that they are just gauging fan reaction. I think they have a very definitive plan that they're going with and that's what they're going with because that was not open-ended enough to be vague and cut and be played in either direction. That felt very much like a panicked, oh shit. Uh, that was just, that was not a good, oh shit. That was a, what am I going to fucking do? And I just don't see, I mean, it might be that there is something else resulting in the test that is like, you know, getting her attention and it isn't about the paternity that 
you know, but in terms of it being played as just like, oh, he is, you know, I just don't see that that would be possible. I don't think the show does that sort of thing, like, that feels quite so cheap, you know what I mean? Um, oh, Ashley says Olivia. Um, yeah, that's true. So Olivia, yeah, that's too bad, because she's good. She's not, like, central, but she's gotten work on like Bridgerton, and I'm I'm wondering if she's just you know has such a more central role in that show that they were just like yeah we're gonna we're gonna take her because those are both Netflix series. So, um, and Ashley says unless it's her commitment phobe stuff coming to the front, nah, wouldn't buy it. That's just me. But even if that's how they tried to play it, I would not buy it. It would feel really cheap. It would just feel like they were trying to like. It would feel like a Walking Dead move, to be honest. You know, that's something like Walking Dead has done so many times is they will have an ending of a season be a huge cliffhanger. And it is so clear that they are deciding what is the cliffhanger is going to have been while they are writing the next season because they are nothing if not trying to fuck with their fans. This show just doesn't strike me as doing that. So I don't it might not be that he's not the father, but it's definitely that something is wrong. Um and you know, I don't know. We'll see. Um All right, all right, all right. So let's talk about Eric because he comes to see Otis such a good boy. I love that they have the two of them being physically affectionate with each other too. Like they hug and they hang out in the waiting room and like Otis has his head on Eric's shoulder. And it's just so sweet to see like male characters getting to be physical without it being weird. It doesn't feel unnatural or forced from either of them, especially considering that Eric is gay. There's like, you know, you all know about the whole no homo thing that guys would do. It was such a 2000s thing. And I haven't seen it much since then. Thank God. But, you know, having one of the characters actually be gay and the other straight and aware the other is gay and there's still no weirdness about it at all because of course it fucking isn't because they are good friends and it's just not like that between them it's just thank you thank you show so much for that um so (laughs) they have first eric explaining to otis about kissing somebody else and Otis is like, well, like, you're not a bad person because Eric is saying, like, I didn't tell you because I was ashamed and I didn't know what it meant. And Otis says, I don't even know why I did it. I just felt free. And what I love about him explaining this is that that is exactly what I got from the scene when he was in it. You know, he walks into the back room of that club and looks around and you see this sense of utter joy exuding from him of just like belonging and nothing is said. And he starts making out with this guy and I just got it. It was such a well done scene that I wasn't going, no, what are you doing? I was going, "Ooh, yeah, I get it. I really get it. So later on, when he's talking to Adam, and Adam says, you wouldn't take it back. And he says, I wouldn't. I just felt so good about how well the show got all of that across. So that once they have this conversation, it absolutely rang true to me. And it made total sense. And there was no bit of me kind of going, wait, what am I supposed to be thinking? You know? I just really have to say that this show, it started off strong and I just feel like they have really found their footing and are trusting their audience a little bit more. And I think some of that is also that they know we've gotten to know the characters better as well. So they don't feel the need to hold our hand quite as much. And it's so lovely to like stand back and watch this story unfold this way and how much of this episode is about people deciding to let go relationships that don't serve them that's like 
the, so many season finales are about people getting together. But instead, we've got the, first of all, we've got the whole thing with the school, which we'll get into. But we have um, Eric and Adam breaking up. We've got Jackson and Cam, where, or uh, Cal, where Cal is saying, I just can't carry you because you don't know. And I also don't know. We have Maureen taking a step away from Michael. We, there's just a lot. I mean, even Otis and Maeve, Maeve is doing something that is right for her and Maeve and Isaac. He is like asking for some space right now. Amy and uh, what's his face? Steve. Everybody is kind of like winding up broken up at the end of this season. And yet it doesn't feel like a hopeless season finale. It feels like a natural ending to relationships that have run their course. And that is a very difficult thing to pull off. And it is also something that a lot of shows aren't interested in doing. They don't want relationships to have run their course because they can milk relationships for drama very cheaply. And it's just so refreshing to see this acknowledgement in media of the fact that like relationships are often a step in learning more about yourself and the world. They are not as much as we would like to believe the answer to life. We have fed or been fed a lot of like this idea that finding your partner, your one true partner is something that everybody needs to do, that there is someone for everyone in that sense. And that once you find them, things just will be so good for you that the rest is gravy. And yo, uh, uh, Mm -mm, no. And, and all we're doing by telling people this is setting them up for disappointment because you can have like such a great relationship, but if you aren't adapting and growing and continuing to work on that relationship, it's not going to sustain you and you need to be aware of who you are. And this thing with Adam and Eric, Eric is so joyful and so honest about who he is and has managed to like even have a talk with his mother who had been the one he was having the most difficulty being himself around. And Adam hasn't told his mother that he was even gay. Didn't want them to like kiss in front of the house. At, like he was letting Eric put makeup on him, but he didn't want to go out wearing it. All of this stuff that Eric is like more than comfortable with. It's that he like gets actual joy from it. He flaunts it because that's part of his personality. And being with Adam, who isn't there yet, is stunting him a little bit. Yeah, I could definitely see that. And it's so awful because, like he says, it's not Adam's fault. Adam is moving at the pace that he has to because Adam has a very different kind of trauma than Eric does. So it's understandable with everything that he would be less sure of himself. But there is a point to which that's not Eric's problem. And this is where people start to get into a weird place because it is so popular to think that if your partner is dealing with something difficult, that it's your job to stand by them through that. And I think that there is something to that, but when it's as fundamental as them, like being honest about who they are, that is so fundamental that if they can't even do that, stepping away just feels like a healthy decision to me. And granted, by the end of this episode, Adam has told his mother, but telling her and being open with himself about her, like around her and to his father, I mean, God knows, those aren't the same thing. And I'm just really proud of Eric for realizing what he needs. And as much as he clearly loves Adam, they love each other, you know? It's just so obvious. They have great chemistry. I love them together in a lot of ways. 
But Eric is right. Adam needs some time to grow and deal with some of his bullshit first. And then maybe, you know, who knows? Or not. But I just really enjoyed Eric's honesty because it's so easy to do what Amy does, which is to keep trying to reassure somebody that you love them because you don't want to hurt their feelings. And as that's happening, you're losing parts of yourself because you're trying to ignore them or you're resentful of the person that you're trying to like save their feelings while growing resentment because you want to be rid of them, honestly. And you can't even like admit that to yourself, you know? So that I I just think that they are showing they are representing a really healthy romantic attitude in this show that is underrepresented dramatically. Um let's see. Oh, okay. So um sorry guys. Ashley's in the chat says uh, Olivia leaving has led to speculation that we might lose Eric due to his Doctor Who casting, and I hope not because I would really miss him, not that he's indicated any intention to leave. Uh, Viv has her boyfriend, Eugene. Oh, my God. Yeah, we are going to talk about that in a second. Um, yeah, I was sort of wondering whether Eric was going to be able to do both because I don't know how much – you know what I mean? And if they have to take him off of the show – I will be super sad because he is just such a bright light. Um, but, you know, like, I get it. It's fucking Doctor Who, one of the biggest franchises in the entire world. Um, so, okay. So that's Eric. And God, Adam's acting. He's so good, too. I just, I know I've said this, but oh, man. Him trying not to cry throughout this conversation. It's so heart-wrenching. Um, so, all right, let me just talk about Viv and Eugene, because there's such a great guys. They have the slow-mo walk to the front doors of the school while Milkshake plays, which is just such a classic. And it's so great because anytime that somebody who's like kind of a dork says that they have a boyfriend or girlfriend, but you don't know them, they go to a different school. That's code for like, yeah, sure. Either they are not real or it's somebody that you met on like AOL instant messenger, or at least in my day who God knows like who they are or what they look like, or if they're even like a teenager or whatever. And it is so delightful. He showed up at her door at the end of the last episode and I completely forgot about him. And then we have a slow-mo of the camera panning across a bunch of shocked faces. And we don't know what they're reacting to. And then all of a sudden, the camera flips around. And we see Viv strutting to the front doors of the school with this fucking babe on her arm. Like, okay, she... <laughs> Uh, damn. Good for you, Viv. I love this so much. And and something that is like a kind of an aside, and I don't know if this was done on purpose, but even if it wasn't, I think it's really something that deserves pointing out. So, so often in media, the colorism within the black community, even within black led productions like Tyler Perry movies, for example, there will be dark skinned male leads with lighter skinned female leads. Men are allowed to be darker skinned, but women are not seen as desirable. If they're much darker, they have to be lighter than the male. And usually like to the point that they're mixed race, you know, they're like that light skinned. And it's a, a very like pervasive reality. If you look into this, there's a lot of think pieces and a lot of evidence that has piled up over the nature of darkness in skin tone being associated with masculinity. And the more you like notice it, the more you realize, oh yeah, wow, that's absolutely a thing. So Viv being as dark skinned as she is with this fine as fuck, lighter skinned male partner is really, really unusual to see. 
And it is just really nice to have some representation of a dark skinned woman who is being like adored and accepted completely by a man who's lighter skinned than she is. Not he's not like light skin by any means, but he is lighter than her. And that is just really, really rare. So if that's not something that you particularly pay attention to, um, I encourage you to look into that a little bit more because the association between lightness and femininity and darkness and masculinity is just everywhere. Which is kind of funny because like when you look at yin and yang, the sun is and light is actually meant to be associated with masculinity and darkness is meant to be like the more feminine. So, you know, it's all just about mm, white supremacy as usual. But anyway, um, Rowan says, I date a lot of people from my church camp when I was in high school in the 90s. It never occurred to me that my friends in school might not believe me. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's just like one of those. It's sort of funny because like at my school, we had a, a a lot of towns only have the one high school for the town. But my town was big enough and had a dense enough like suburban population that we had two schools. So there was mine, which was Sheehan, and then there was Lyman Hall. And uh, so at my school, dating people that you didn't know from your own school wasn't mistrusted quite as much because it was much more common to have met people from Lyman Hall. But it was still like, I think nowadays probably too, with the internet becoming a lot more normalized and just part of everybody's everyday lives, having an online boyfriend would probably be believed a lot more readily today. If you tried that in, you know, 2003, it's you would get a very different reaction. You know, it's the same thing as like online dating then and now online dating then felt like this massive risk. And so it was but like, dating is a risk. Anyway, even if you think you know the person. So yeah, it was just that was like, such a thing is be like, Oh, yeah, oh, your girlfriend, but we don't know her. Oh, sure. Okay. Like that was just one of those kinds of jokes. Um, but I'm so happy. And Viv, unfortunately, then gets sort of brought back down to earth because she does like the hair flip as she's walking in. Like she knows how hot this man is. And then accidentally walks right into a uh, like one of those janitor trolleys and goes head first into the garbage. And it is so embarrassing. Her legs are like up into the up in the air. <laughs> it's really something. Oh, girl, I'm so sorry. Um. Ashley says, yeah, but I think it might go back to people with paler skin being less likely to work in farms out in the sun. So farm work equals masculinity. Maybe that's the reasoning. I mean, racism, too. That's the reason also. I don't know. I won't comment on, like, the reasoning because, like, it hasn't that. I've been in a lot of black spaces and seen a lot of conversation about it. And that has never been brought up. I'll be honest. That sort of, like, reasoning for it. So whether or not that's a thing, I won't comment on. I'll just say that I haven't seen it. So it's certainly possible, but that doesn't seem to be, it just seems to be that like women who are lighter skinned are more prized inherently because of the, their proximity to whiteness and men see them as more desirable because they are like sort of leveling up the further away from dark skinned women they get. And the ideal is winding up actually with a white woman, if possible. And that's sort of like, you know, part of the overall, like, subtler messaging there. Um, but again, not my community, and I don't want to speak on it too much. It's just that's the way that I have seen it presented in the the places that I've seen it talked about. Um, so... Uh, everybody, everybody, they're so, okay, I'm going to talk about Maeve. So Maeve is in class and she gets, she looks out the window and sees somebody waving their arms. Now I will be honest. I initially thought that this was Amy that because we cut from Amy and Maureen realizing that the keys are locked in the house and the goat is in there. And then before we see what they're up to, we go to uh, Maeve. So I was like, is Amy trying to get Maeve's help getting in the house? Like maybe because of, you know, knowing that Maeve is connecting with Otis right now. Um, 
But it is not. It is Maeve's mom, who is supposed to be on the lam. And she's hiding in this shrub, tells Maeve to come in, and has a big wad of cash that she gives Maeve. When Maeve asks where she got it, she says, it doesn't matter, I sold some shit. And I was just like, mm, I look, okay, maybe it doesn't matter, like, really, but I still really do want to know. <laughs> like, it, it definitely made me worried, you know, like, I just don't, there, there is so much room for her to fuck up again. You know, and I was just so certain that we were going to wind up fighting, finding out that she was like selling drugs or like stealing, maybe, you know, like God knows. So it's fine. You know, we don't really need to know for the sake of this. It's fine. But I do kind of feel a little bit twitchy about it. So. She tells Maeve, I want you to go do that America thing. And Maeve says that she can't. And her mom is like, yeah, you fucking can. And Maeve then confesses. I agree that I would move in with Anna, the foster mom. And she gets really emotional here. And this is one of those things that is wild. Where... A, an authority figure can let you down so often and everything that you are meant to be able to rely on them for, they will fail to deliver on. And yet you will still feel guilt associated with the fact that you don't have the kind of loyalty you're supposed to. And it's just not a rational thing, but it's, it's so fucking annoying and we've already seen this with her mother guilting her over calling the cops when actually Maeve was doing the right thing for her little sister. And yet even so, even though Maeve knows that was the right call, she got fucked up over it. And then she has this moment with her mother giving her this money where she feels guilty taking it because she is siding with the enemy is like kind of the vibe, right? And she says, I feel like I'm leaving you behind. And for once, her mother actually takes responsibility and says, you're not leaving me behind. I left you behind. I was too young and stupid to have kids. And I have just done nothing but let you down over and over and over again. So let me at least do this one thing for you. Take this money and go like actually do something for yourself. And it's really, really sweet. And it's like, it wouldn't be, out of line if the show just had her mother letting her down again and that would be valid as well but i liked to see a bit of growth from her mom you know it's hard one for sure but that she's able to admit this and hand the money over without any real like she wants her to use it for america but then she's like if you don't want to do that use it to buy something for your room like it's yours i am going to it, it, it's completely up to you what you do with it and it's a really moving moment. And all I could think when I was watching this, um, a couple of weeks ago, I watched the uh, Death on the Nile movie that came out with uh, Gal Gadot as like one of the leads. And it's a Poirot like mystery. And she, the girl who plays Maeve is in it as this like sex pot. And it's so funny to see her like having to be an adult, like, you know, of course she nails it because she is an adult, but it's just a weird adjustment to see somebody who's been playing a teenager for like, and a teenager of Maeve's type specifically, you know, like a disaffected, rebellious, and then to go and see her as this other character. I just kept, for some reason, like this moment brought to mind again, the quality of acting on the show. Um, so later on, she's with Amy and Amy finds this wad of money and is like, what is this? And she tells her, oh, my mom gave me the money 
for the America program. They have a flight for me tomorrow, but I'm not going. And Amy is like, excuse me, what? Why not? And Maeve says, well, everything is finally going well with Otis and I don't want to screw that up. And Amy does the best thing. She takes Maeve by the hands and pulls her over to the bed and has her sit down, kneels in front of her and says, look at me. And then asks Maeve, if I had this opportunity and I was giving it up for the sake of a boy, what would you say to me? Well played, Amy, because Maeve knows exactly what the fuck she would say to her. And it's the kind of thing that people will do all the time. It's like women will especially do it because we are expected to be the ones to compromise in favor of a relationship. Because for us, it's much more like relationships and keeping a man are much more tied to our worthiness and value societally than it is for men but men will do this too i'm just saying women it tends to be more frequent but they're not the only ones by any means um but when you are in the midst of a relationship especially when you're this young and it's sort of new it feels like the most important thing in the world and it is like i always try to be careful about using minimizing language because saying it feels so important, but it's not, that's not really true or fair. It is super important. It's a very real important thing to you that deciding to walk away from will have a genuine effect on your emotions. It will cause like distraction and feelings of like there, all of that is real, but What it is, is that proportionally looking back on those times in your life, you will realize how what you were feeling at the time was extremely real and it mattered, but you were tied up in it in a way that was not entirely logical because your hormones are at such a fucking frenzy at that point in your life that it can cloud your judgment and your emotional reactions will be completely out of proportion to what's going on. So that's not to say that it's not real because it absolutely is real. It's just that you don't have that kind of like perspective yet. And the temptation to pursue something that makes you emotionally feel so strongly over something that is like a theoretical opportunity, potential benefit for the future, but uproots you and might be difficult and strange. It is not really surprising how many people give up on opportunities in favor of a relationship Because relationships can make you feel so good and doing strange, scary, risky things can feel terrible. So it's really easy to say that somebody made a stupid decision by not doing the thing. But when you step back and look at like what they're feeling in those moments, it's so understandable. And thankfully, even when I had a really strong attachment to my boyfriend in high school, that did not stop me one whit. I still went out there and like left school senior year and went to a different school. And I then like went to college out of state. Like I had no compunction about it at all. But I'm also somebody who manages to shut that kind of thing off pretty easily. And I know a lot of people aren't really like that. So I just, I I am holding a lot of compassion for Maeve that she was thinking about it this way because God love Maeve. She has not had a lot of stability and feeling like she has something with Otis that's real and potentially could be stable with somebody who is reliable and on her side. Of course, that's going to be super appealing to her at this point. You know, like I'm not mad at her for that. It's just Amy is right. She's 100% right. It's just, really, really understandable. Um, Rowan said, I'm surprised Maeve doesn't say anything about wanting to stay for her sister or wanting her sister to... I thought about that too, Rowan. I was thinking about that actually like while watching the episode because just a couple uh, frames earlier, like she's being told by Anna, 
you can stay in this room I know that she loves having you around. So that's like part of the deal. And then she's immediately leaving. So I was kind of surprised it doesn't come up as well. Um, Ashley says, but also she spent very little time living with Elsie. So maybe she doesn't feel a need to be there physically. Um, And Anna's a stable parental figure. I wouldn't be surprised if she didn't think of Elsie as potentially needing it. I think it's one of those things I wouldn't have been surprised she brought up, but I can understand it now coming up also or not coming up also, I think is what that was supposed to say. Um, Yeah, I think that's a good point is that, you know, if it weren't for the situation with having Anna to rely on and knowing she will take good care of Elsie maybe she wouldn't have pursued it or she could rationalize another reason to stay. But the Otis thing, I think in terms of the way the show tends to like want to frame things in a way that's relatable to the average viewer, framing it as that it's all about him seems like something that would just be a lot easier to connect with for a lot of viewers. Um, That's not to say that it wouldn't make sense for her, at least bringing it up though. I agree. So, yeah, I uh, I just really enjoy Amy and Maeve's relationship. It's so fun to see how the two of them have, like, grown to respect each other and connect with each other's, like, real desires and dreams in a way that they can see past the bullshit when they're each trying to be in denial about a particular thing. It's just a really sweet aspect of friendship that uh, I... He, it just seems like so, so much writing is centered around the cheap drama that we just don't get to see this sort of thing that often. And I love it. It's just really refreshing. Um, So, okay, okay, okay. We've got to talk about the school. So Hope has resigned. And we run into her weirdly at the hospital um, with Otis in a scene that winds up being kind of key because Otis's mom sort of hangs out around the corner and listens to him talking with Hope about her struggle with grief over the fact that it doesn't look like she's going to be able to have children. And she, there's no, like, the, there was a mention of her having a partner in one episode and that he couldn't be there with her, right? But, So, like, he exists, but he isn't important enough to really, like, show up in in the show for us. Um, But she's talking to Otis about this and just unloading about how my body is supposed to do this one thing. And it's something that I really want it to do. And it won't. And it makes me feel like a failure and like something is wrong with me, like I'm broken. And um, it is a really well handled scene of Otis being like, I think you're really brave for confronting the grief of not getting something that you really want. And it's kind of sweet because his mother afterwards is like, I can see that you connect with therapy. I just want you to be aware of what a huge responsibility it is. And they have a really nice talk about the high that they each get talking with people and connecting with people. And it's so cute because like so much, so a storyline that's so frequently put out there is like a parent does a certain job as a career and expects their child to walk in their footsteps. And that child doesn't want to do the thing their parent does. And that is something that their parent has difficulty accepting and that their child is willing to put out there. And with Otis, it's a sort of reverse thing where he wants it this like he wants to pursue a similar job as his mother, but is so frustrated with her so much of the time that he can't admit to himself how much he like enjoys it and how important it is to him because there's almost a sense of smugness from her about that. He's like walking down the same road as her. And that is so relatable for me personally, like as somebody who I don't, I don't want others telling me what to do or feeling like they were right. I will definitely like not pursue a thing, even if it's good for me, because I just want to give somebody the finger. So I just really like that they have that talk. Um, But Hope has resigned from the school 
And when everybody goes in the next day, she isn't in the headmaster's office. It's empty. And they wind up getting called to a meeting with the uh, the investor guy that had been coming and talking to Hope, who informs them that the investors are pulling all of their backing out of the school. And that starting next term, they all have to have figured out alternative education solutions for themselves. And it's a really kind of great moment of the show being like, yeah, they pulled off something that felt extremely satisfying last episode, and they were not wrong. But also, that shit does come with very real consequences. And they are going to have to like look at the fact that they decided to do something because they believed in it and it was the right thing to do and it didn't get them where they wanted it to get them. And that's how that fucking goes sometimes. So I'm really excited to see what happens because we have the kids realizing hope's not in her office. And then um, the teacher, the music teacher, I can't remember his name. I'm so bad with him, his name and the teacher that Adam invites to the dog show. Um, But The kids sort of suggest to him that maybe he should apply to be the head teacher job. And then later on, the other teacher is in the hall and spots this guy leaving. Um, Or no, he's arriving, actually, because she doesn't know yet they're going to shut the school down. So she asks if she can put her name forward for a position uh, as headmaster, headmistress, whatever, head teacher. And... He tells her we're not accepting applications in a very abrupt sort of way that really in the moment feels like it's a personal rejection. Like we have somebody in mind and we don't want you. And then we find out oh, it's not like that, actually. It genuinely is that they're not taking applications because they're not going to fucking reopen. And I am very hopeful that she and her boyfriend will somehow organize something outside of this building together to help all of these kids um and i'm just like yeah i i like the potential there but i just don't know at all what that would even look like um ashley says emily sand and colin hendrix thank you i will not remember that but thank you (laughs) um so yeah we'll see what's going i do think it's interesting though that like the kids tell him that he should put his name forward and Nobody says that to her. She puts herself forward. And I personally think that she's a better fit. It's not just like he's a great teacher who loves to inspire his students, but he is a bit of a scatterbrain and he isn't really very good at the enforcing discipline kind of thing. And she clearly does not suffer fools. So I feel like she would be a better fit for it, but it doesn't seem like anybody thought of her for it, which I think is kind of revealing. Um, so yeah, that is, that is how this like all ends. And it's just, what a great season. I loved it so much. Um, the one thing that sort of felt weird to me was like Otis connecting with hope. It's definitely, obviously that scene is meant to be much more about Otis himself and what he likes to do and realizing how much he enjoys it. But the thing with Hope wanting to get pregnant and not being able to and the the attitude of like authoritarianism that she's bringing to the school, it's sort of like, I think what we're supposed to be getting from it is that she's trying to control things really strongly because there's another part of her life that she has absolutely no control over. Um, and I have no problem with that like aspect of her being brought into the show. But it is sort of a weird, like, detail that, I don't know, it's like, I, it works fine because they don't try and go too hard at it. But it did sort of stop a couple times and be like, why are we talking to her about this again? You know what I mean? And again, it's it's much more to showcase Otis than it is to showcase her, but... Okay, I'm over time. I really have to wrap up. But thank you again, Ashley, so much for commissioning this. This is so much fun to cover. I really, really enjoyed this season a lot. And um, I hope more people watch the show. I'm trying to encourage folks to... And I told Owen, like, we got to start over. And we got to... I want him to watch it from the beginning. The only episode I want to skip is the Hedwig beat-up episode, because I can't deal. But otherwise, yeah. So good. 
Um, all right, guys. Thank you again. Love you so much. Until next time. Toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.